There is one God the Father He who created all things Through His Son, the one Lord Jesus Christ The sacrifice for death's pain And there is one hope of salvation at the end and there is one faith the one that purifies from sin and there is one baptism the one Jesus died to give by one spirit into one body that lives through the power of the love that flows through the veins of the Father and the Son and through the children every day Good evening to you once again, and once again, this is the By One Spirit broadcast. I'm Larry Hale. I'm glad to have you with us this evening. This is my son, Elisha. He'll be playing some gospel music for us, and we're just looking forward to having a good time in the Spirit of the Lord tonight. We depend on Him to, to give us the grace to, what it, to do whatever it is He wants done and get whatever out He wants put out. And so I'm thankful to have this opportunity, and I'm glad to have you with us, and just ask you to stay tuned, if you will, for about the next 25 minutes. And I'm going to turn it over to Elisha and see if he has a song or a testimony or anything that's on his mind, and, uh, and just let the Lord have his way with him for the moment. I'd like to start out by playing a song, but first of all, I'd like to tell a little bit of how this song came to me. We had actually been discussing with somebody about that if people can take away certain external things, if they can take away your Bible and you're no longer connected to God, then you weren't connected enough in the first place. And if they can take away your services and you're no longer connected to God, then you weren't connected enough. That's right. So there's a, there's a real reality to no matter what, be connected. You know, no matter, if, if people fail you, if people let you down and you're not connected anymore, you weren't connected enough. That's right. To this. And this song's about that. Though Demas may forsake me, and though Judas may betray, and though my friends may leave as I walk this narrow way, I will follow you and pave the path. No matter who goes, I'll hold to his hand. And if it is ten thousand enemies at my right, or if I am looking into a furnace of fire, Lord, let your holiness be my
That's so, right. Walk out and he'll walk with you. Amen. It's like you've always said is that, you know, every moment is, is where you're being made. That's right. You know, every, you're preparing yourself for what you'll be in great trials by mm -hmm. what you are in small mm -hmm. things. Amen. That's right. We're conditioning ourselves today for what we deal with tomorrow and condition ourselves tomorrow for what we deal with in the future. And uh, every moment should be lived as your last because you should keep your heart with all diligence, as the Scripture says, for out of it are the issues of life. Uh, in other words, the goings forth of everything we do and say comes from in our hearts. So if our hearts are, are really pure before God by the power of His Spirit and we're really connected, joined, uh, like you were talking about, to Him, uh, then the issues of our life are going to be the issues of His life because it's going to no longer be us that lives, but He that lives in us. And that's, that's what it's about. That's, that's the aim, that's the purpose and goal of the gospel is to glorify Jesus. And, and it's really Him glorifying Himself and His Father through us if we have His Spirit and, and if we allow His Spirit to, to put aside the things of, of our own nature and flesh that we were born with and uh, put those things to death. The power of God's Spirit will burn the carnal, mate, carnal mind, the carnal nature, and literally purge it, purify it from us if we will allow that, because that's why we receive a spirit, is, is to put the, the old man to death and let the new man, which is Christ in us, uh, be alive and doing fine so that everybody around us can see him and feel him. And um, it's a beautiful thing, I tell you. I, I've been in this 31 years, and... Uh, I, I remember when I first started going to these little uh, mission mission and prayer meetings and worship and everything, and people were filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'd hear them say, you know, over and over, it's oh, it's real, you know, it's it's real. And I, I remember when I first started out, you know, I didn't know what to think too much, but I thought, well, if it's so real, why do they have to keep saying it's real, you know? But I hung around a little bit, a little while, and I found out. Amen. I, I've been in 31 years, and I'll tell you, the best thing about it is it's real. <laughs> Woo, man, I mean, this is this is the real thing, the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know, when people hear that word baptism, and all they can think of is water, but Jesus suffered and died and rose again to bring us a baptism that fulfilled the baptism that led to him and that symbolized his baptism and that introduced him onto the scene which God gave to John the Baptist. And that, bapti that baptism is administered by Jesus himself. He baptizes with the Holy Ghost. That's what John said about him. The one who was come to introduce him and to, and to speak of what his mission was about said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but there comes one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And that fire is, uh, to come full circle here to your song, that the Holy Ghost baptism imparts the power of God into our souls and spirit, washes sin away from us, the only thing that can. Um, Jesus said in Acts 1 and 8, you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And that power is to give us power over the very inner nature of sin because it says in Romans chapter 5 that when we were yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. Sin had power over us. We were all born in sin. And uh, the law that God gave to Israel did not remedy that problem. It it, uh, it pictured it and it symbolized it and it was a figurative form of that but it didn't impart that life and power to the soul and the spirit of man didn't take sin away and, and we're told in Hebrews 10 and 4 it was not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins which were Old Testament sacrifices but you back up a chapter into Hebrews 9 and 13 and 14 
It says, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, under the old covenant, gave a, 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 a figurative form of sanctification, it says, How much more? Three really big words in the New Testament writings that a lot of people are missing. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge or purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And it talks about in Hebrews 10 there, uh, up to the fourth verse where I just quoted from previously, it talks about how the, the, all of those sacrifices were made year by year under the law. And, and uh, it says that it, if the conscience had been made right, the conscience had been made perfect, then those sacrifices wouldn't have continued to be offered. So uh, those who are partaker of that covenant were never purified from their sins, and therefore their conscience still told them they had sin. And, and that's, you know, that's a problem today. That's why I said that how much more in Hebrews 9 and 14 is such a big statement because... Uh, the devil has deceived the body of Christ today in all of Christianity for that matter, which the body of Christ is under, is under the doctrines and traditions of Christianity wrongly uh, because the traditions and doctrines of Christianity are that you don't really get free from sin on the inside completely. Nobody gets completely free from sin. You're still a sinner and you're still going to you're still going to sin habitually, really. I mean, it doesn't mean every moment you just want to do all the wrong things, but you'll never be able to get free from that that inner working of sin causing you to, to fall short. And and, uh, and that we're still saved by this grace, uh, this Christian uh, theory of grace that still saves us even though it leaves us sinners. That That's wrong. Uh, if we don't get free from sin on the inside of us, and get rid of it to where it's not working, to where it's not trying to bring you under dominion. Whoo, glory to God to do the wrong things. Uh, if we don't get free from that, we will not be saved. Because the Bible says that that uh, perfect love casts out fear, 1 John 4 and 18. And he that fears is not made perfect in love. Fear has torment. And then you come up to Revelation 21 and 8, and you find out that the fearful along with the unbelieving and the idolaters and all liars will have their part in the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. So if we're not made perfect in love, we're not going to be saved. You can't, you can't even begin to perfect the love of God in your heart unless you've been baptized with the Holy Ghost, which experience has always been evidenced and in, in, uh, signified initially by speaking with other tongues. Uh, not to mention by uh, an abundance of divine love and peace and joy that fills the soul and, and a cleanness of heart that, that you never imagined possible. I know this by experience. I know it by experience 31 years ago. My goodness, I know, by, know it by experience today. Praise God. But you, you, because it says in Romans 5 and 5 that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. So you can't even have the love of God unless you have the Holy Ghost in your life. And there's no such thing in the Bible as receiving the Holy Ghost apart from being baptized with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. It's not in the Bible. It's, and it's, it's, it's not true. So you've got to really come clean with God. And when you do and your heart is, is fully given over to Him, then He'll baptize, Jesus will baptize you with the Spirit, and He'll furnish His sign from heaven to signify that, uh, because He's the only one that knows the hearts, and He's the only one uh, that is worthy or qualified to say that a person's heart and soul has met His terms, their faith has met His terms, their repentance has met His terms, and that He's washed them clean. He's the only one qualified to say that because he's the only one that knows the hearts of men and he knows when that repentance and faith is, is right and it's full. That's why the sign of speaking with other tongues was given because it's a sign of the covenant. It's God's sign. He's always had a sign that he's, he's uh, given with every covenant that he's made with man. He's provided a sign to mark evidence of that covenant simply because it's not in man 
to be able to determine that he's entered into covenant with God. Man uh, doesn't even know his own heart, doesn't even know his own spirit, man, uh, the way God does for sure. And so God has had to provide that that evidence and sign with each covenant. Speaking with other tongues is the sign of this covenant. It's the one that was that was present with everybody that received this experience on the day of Pentecost, which was the birth of the body of Christ. And we're told that by one spirit uh, are we all baptized into one body in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. So there's no, there's no Holy Ghost without the Holy Ghost baptism, and there's no love of God without the Holy Ghost. And then after we receive the spirit we receive we receive the power of the spirit to purify our hearts from everything that's unlike god daily and to have power to deny sin and ungodliness and to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world as it said in titus 2 11 and 12. and that is done by him by his spirit 2 Corinthians 3 and 17 says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Well, what are we talking about liberty? There's only one thing to talk about liberty about, and that's free from sin. Liberated from sin. That, that's what the Gospel's all about. That's what Jesus came for. Romans 8 and 2 says He came for sin, and to condemn sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You have to have the Spirit to walk after the Spirit. Uh, many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, Romans 8 and 14. And again, you have to have the Spirit. You have to be baptized with the Spirit by Jesus with the sign of speaking with other tongues and all the evidence of, the, of the holiness, love, and peace being filled, filled uh, poured out into your soul and filling your heart in order to be led by the Spirit. But you do have the choice after receiving the Spirit is whether you're going to choose to let the Spirit uh, mortify the deeds of the body, the works of the flesh, uh, the manner of the carnal nature, as we're told in Romans 8 and 13, or whether we're going to walk, or whether we're just going to, we're just going to slack and just be slothful spiritually and, and just float right back into the flesh and let the flesh have its way and live after the flesh. And we're told in Romans 8 and 13 also that if we live after the flesh, we'll die. Well, I got news for you. Everybody's going to die. Like, we go to funerals and things. We're all going out of this world like that. But that's not what it's talking about. Uh, it's talking about spiritually dying, separated from God. So, you have to have the Spirit, but we have to purify ourselves and keep our hearts with all diligence. And as 1 John 3 and 3 says, purify ourselves even as He is pure. Again, purifying our hearts and souls daily from everything that's not like Him, that's not of His love and His goodness and peace. And, and uh, we have to do that in order to perfect the love of God to get rid of the fear of man, the fear of death, the fear of circumstances and things like that. And that's the calling, is to perfect the love of God. And uh, I thank the Lord for that because the Lord has allowed me over 31 years to continue steadfast and, and uh, to go forward. That's not to say I've never fallen short. My goodness, that would be, that would be ridiculous to, to suggest nobody's ever fallen short. Everybody's fallen short. Um, and I'm saying after being born again, after having this experience, uh, you, you've got to stay on top of this. But I'll tell you this, there's a growing in the Spirit to where you're falling short is fewer and further between the smaller and eventually you basically don't fall short yes i am saying there's a place where you don't fall short anymore you better believe it that's perfecting holiness in the fear of god and we're told in second corinthians 7 and 1 therefore dearly beloved having these promises let us perfect let us well, it says let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit and perfect holiness in the fear of god so there is a perfecting of holiness uh, and it's a growing thing and a, and a progressive thing. And I'll tell you, if you don't stay on top of it and stay diligent and persevere with honesty and humility and faith, and, and if your chief motivation and, and goal and desire in life is not holiness, meaning pureness of heart and soul, like his song said, uh, then you're going to fail. And, and sin's going to have dominion over you. And, and if you don't get that turned around, you'll be lost. I don't care how born again you were. 
For if you cast out devils or prophesied or did many mighty works, like Jesus said, a lot of people are going to say in the day of judgment, He's going to tell them, I never knew you works of iniquity. It just means that I don't know you or don't associate with you because you chose to go under sin. You can go great places in God and still fall off if, if you just let yourself go. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, he said, I keep my own body under subjection lest after I have preached unto others I myself should be a castaway. And we're talking about the greatest man of God in the history of the world that didn't come from heaven. And, uh, you know, a lot of people like to say Romans chapter 7 where he said that he, you know, uh, when he would try to do good, he found evil present, and you know, to will was present with him, but how to perform it was as good. He didn't find people saying he was struggling with sin. Uh, the Apostle Paul wasn't struggling with sin, my friend. He was talking about in Romans 7 his condition before he was born again when he was under the law. And like I said, the law didn't impart that power and that life from heaven to give us the capacity to live holy before God. And uh, the Apostle Paul was. He was telling the truth when he said, it's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. And, and there's no sin in Christ. So if he, it wasn't no longer him that lived, but Christ living in him, he wasn't sinning. I can assure you of that. But uh, just those few words on it, and I'm going to let him finish here with the song. I've gone on longer than what I anticipated, but I apologize for nothing. It's been in the Spirit, and I'm, I'm so thankful that the Lord allows me to go along for the ride. Amen. Go ahead. Hmm. Jesus wasn't born in a penthouse to the high priest. He was born to common people, then was laid amongst the beasts. And the apostles weren't princes picked from the peaks of the earth. They were common men with common needs who simply had a face. God has chosen the foolish things to confound. Would be wise oh, to give needed vision to the blind and to seal shut arrogant eyes. To give everything to whom had nothing to lose, but he denied the religious elite, for they knew too much to ever. God picked a messenger to introduce his son. <clears throat> he sent them a man of a while to be the one. Oh, yeah. And when God chose a sign to show his new covenant to all, they spoke in tongues and staggered like drunken men when the Holy Ghost did fall. Yes. Glory oh, to God. God has chosen Woo. my flesh. Summed up his love in one holy deal. His law written upon our hearts, the Holy Ghost seal. Yeah. To simplify every ceremony that came before. Never know 
song. <laughs> what a God. What, what a spirit. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, it feels good. I, I'm just so thankful. That I, I, like I said, to be along for the ride. Me Jesus too. is driving. Me too. And, <laughs> I'm watching. I'm sitting somewhere in the back loving it, man. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God, man! It feels so good down deep inside. My goodness, this 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 here will carry you over there. This will carry you to the glory That's world, right. and this is the only thing that will, because this is from the glory world. Amen. It says in Hebrews six, we've tasted of the power of the world to come. Hallelujah! Faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen the true faith that was once delivered to the saints is the substance of heaven itself Woo, my kingdom of god righteousness and peace and joy in the holy ghost it's the evidence the evidence not the hope so think so wish so it is the evidence of the things not seen, which is the realm where God is at and all the glory that's there. And I'm thankful tonight to have a piece of it in me. God bless you this evening. We'll be back with you again next week. Check in with us then.